Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this uh, exclusive session with uh, author Ruchira Chaudhary. I know uh, I have got uh, confirmations from different parts of the globe, from the eastern side as well as some from the western side. Uh, I, if it's too late for you, uh, thank you so much for logging in. And uh, please do share your location on the chat window so that we know which part of the world you're logging in from. And uh, as you all uh, may have seen the teaser earlier, uh, this author, Ms. Ruchira Chaudhary, she doesn't need much introduction. However, I'm going to share a few things uh, which uh, you may find it interesting. She is alumni of uh, University of Chicago Booth School uh, of Business, and she is a consultant. She is someone who straddles between academia and consulting so that whatever uh, theories and patterns that she sees in her consulting engagements, she brings it back to school to create leaders of future. So that's what I really like about her. And uh, if you look at her book cover, we have uh, two powerful women who have uh, uh, shared their uh, you know, appreciation for this book. One of them is uh, Cheryl uh, Shang. Uh, sorry, one second. I'll just bring it up on the screen. Cheryl talks about how coaching for leaders is important and uh, Ruchira also shares a lot of anecdotes from business world and it's a privilege, complete privilege for me to bring her to all of you. Uh, we got connected through a common friend who is also alumni of uh, Chicago Booth uh, Business School, Mr. Deepak Soni. Thank you Deepak for uh, connecting us. It's been a wonderful journey uh, working with uh, Ruchira. Hi Ruchira. Welcome Thank to the you. show. Thank you. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank you, Bhaskar. And you have been really kind enough to give uh, more time uh, from your busy schedule in a preparatory uh, phase. We discussed a few things in terms of what resonates with each of, each of us on this book. And uh, one of the main questions which uh, many people ask after the author releases the book is uh, why a book on leadership and why uh, especially on uh, uh, coaching. There's so many books out there. Why another book on leadership or coaching? Maybe we can start a conversation with that. Thank you. Um, it's actually a good <laughs> segue into uh, the whole conversation about why coaching, why leadership. Okay, so first things, it is not a book on leadership. I would say that again, and that's how the book preface starts. It truly doesn't want to be a book that tells you how to be a leader. Because the assumption is you're already a leader. You're already a leader who wants to make the journey from being a good leader to a fantastic one or a good leader to an uncommon one. Right? And I have tried to define uncommon leaders through examples, through ideas, through stories. Uncommon leaders are those that maximize the success of others by making their successful by making others successful. They take people along in the journey and they realize that it's not just about elevating their organizations or elevating themselves. They also elevate those that they work with and those that they lead. Right. So they relentlessly focus on people and realize that it's not just about, you know, building those empires or growing millions or billions in revenues. It's also about the journey. It's also about building the teams and it's also about building your people and taking them along. And coaching is that key or that code, right, which unlocks this uncommon leadership. So this book is all about how to use coaching as a leader to become that uncommon leader, the one that shines a light on others, the one that elevates others. And you'll find in the book that through examples have shown how when you shine the light on others, you shine brighter yourself. When you elevate others, you soar higher. That's the crux. Perfect, perfect. And you also talk about how this entire world is uh, getting into a VUCA kind of a situation with pandemic thrown in the mix. Uh, it's become even more uh, at a flux and why leaders uh, can, cannot continue with command and control kind of a style and more of a collaborative uh, and uh, coaching becomes one of the integral tools. And you also in your book argue that uh, leaders are uh, more and more getting disillusioned about uh, giving advice and uh, how it is backfiring uh, in many cases, still continues to use that approach. Could you tell us more about uh, why this obsession about uh, you know uh, giving answers to their team members and not holding back long enough so that they can find their own? 
So Bhaskar, it's a bit of a complex, uh, uh, it's a complex question. It'll have a few layers, right? So let's talk about first, let's decode the first part of your question. Why should leaders coach, right? I often get asked that question. Why did you write a book on this? Why can't, uh, you know, uh, why can't we get professional coaches like yourself? Like, if you want to be out of a job, why are you proposing that we shouldn't get external help? Why can't we do that? In organizations, people say human resources can do that for you. And, you know, there are training departments that do, can, can do that for you. Yes, the answer to all of that is yes. But why should the leader coach? Because our narrative around what good leadership today has changed entirely, right? Mm. Leadership today is not just about those numbers or, or building that financial capital. We're all cognizant that leadership is a very complicated, it's a tough balancing act in a very wired world. It's very digitized. It's, there's a lot of interconnectivity. Our businesses are very complex, right? So the leader today, the successful leader, is not just building those reserves of financial capital, but this leader is also looking after governance, right? What we call structural capital. This leader is ensuring their good relationships with customers, with clients, internally and externally. So that's your relational capital. And the last bit is those reserves of human capital, right? The people mm -hmm. part of it. And unless you get that part right, I think increasingly we are realizing if we don't have the right people doing the right things in organizations, we are not going to get to those numbers, right? So there is a school of thought that's telling us. So that's one aspect of it. But the second is, as I was saying earlier, our world today is so complex, so interconnected that no single leader can have the answer, right? Mm. So in the, in the past, if you told people what to do, you have experience, you've done it before, you can tell them. But now everything changes, right? Take the pandemic as, I guess, the best example. You cannot have all the answers. So you need to leverage the collective intelligence of your people. So that command and control style of yesterday has to give way to a more collaborative approach. And the best way to do that is to coach your people. Ask them powerful questions. That would go, that's what good coaching is, right? You ask right. people, don't tell them what to do. You ask them good questions, powerful questions, so they can come up with bright, innovative, intelligent, creative answers. So together, you can go forward or you can forge forward. So I think that's really. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yeah. uh, in two places in your book, uh, I, I was uh, a bit convinced that you know it all uh, are interconnected. One place is uh, where in the last section, part C, you talk about the new learning code. How a leader can collaborate with external coach to maximize their potential and their team's potential. Uh, that gives me a hope that yes, this book will not replace me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we need, we won't be out of jobs. Don't worry about that. Yeah, I guess so, the point I'm making is no leader can do it by themselves, right? Yes. Bring in those experts. Bring in those experts, but bring them at the right juncture. Bring mm -hmm. in at times of change. Bring in at times of turbulence. Bring in when things are changing in your current ecosystem. Bring in at times of uh, transitions. Bring in people like us for the C level who get very little feedback, right? But being, being in coaches for a short period of time. So our role is to come in at short bursts of time and help with a, with a at a certain juncture in the organization's life cycle or the leader's life cycle, right? And so a coach like us cannot be a crutch, right? Mm. You, you need us to tag team and partner with, with that leader. But for the leader, it's a continuum. That coaching doesn't stop. You bring in specialists and for certain to get certain results, but you partner with those specialists, right? But the sole responsibility of building the next line of leaders is yours and yours alone as a leader. That's what the book is really all about. And we cannot delegate that to somebody else. Yeah, exactly. The second part uh, uh, is very well resonating with me is on the culture piece. Most often coaching as an integral part of culture is often neglected. Uh, people think that uh, if we have a fancy, you know, value statement on a poster, it will take care of uh, things. Uh, or uh, if I do outbound training, it should take care of, uh, you know, uh, the needs of people. Or if I buy a movie ticket for family, my HR uh, employee engagement task is done. But that's not culture all about. Uh, there are three things which uh, even, uh, uh, you know, uh, psychologists talk about is uh, we need to have some kind of autonomy towards our work. We need to feel motivated to do our work or mastery uh, on the skill that we have. And uh, we also need to have some kind of empowerment in, in doing what we do. So this is something uh, which is coming often, uh, how coaching can be integral part of the culture, where uh, in team meetings, there is psychological safety for team members to speak up, uh, yeah. those who are in power, 
and you have elaborated that in a very succinct way. Uh, there's a formula also that you have uh, mentioned. <laughs> talk about how coaching can be an integral part of an organization's culture, big or small. Yeah, all boring academics have to put models and frameworks, right? So <laughs> I'm no That's different. For people to remember. So I think <laughs> I'm joking. No, no. It helps, I think, having a, a model or a framework definitely helps. Uh, so let's just talk a little bit about what you were saying, right? Um, let's de let's sort of unpack this thought a bit. Um, of, often organizations believe that if they give across the board training to all their leaders or people down the line on becoming a good coach, automatically those leaders or those managers will morph into good coaches. We also know that reality is very different. You can come home or come back to office from that training and life goes on as usual, right? So what is it that we need to do differently? So let's let's start. First things first, training is great. It's good to give somebody additional skills. But unless the individual believes the, in the fact that coaching is good for his team members, for himself, uh, his or her team members or her, him or herself, that is not going to go anywhere, right? So we, let's call it a coaching mindset. The desire to coach mm. and get coached. So that's the key. Supplement that with some individual skills, fantastic. But that's not enough, right? If we want to move this individual capability into an organizational capacity, i.e. if we want everybody in the organization, regardless mm. of what level they are or the role that they play, if we want them all to be those leader coaches, if we want them to year on year build leaders for tomorrow, right? make it an organization culture, then we need to do things slightly differently. We need to embed it into the DNA of the organization. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that practically? right? We keep saying that, but we need to think about some concrete measures. Uh, you know, It's a strategy model, which I ad adapted. right? So it's called the arc of an organization. The A stands for architecture, R stands for the routines, and C stands for the culture. What is architecture? Very simplistically, it's all the formal systems, and processes in the organization. So the way you evaluate people, the way you promote them, the way you measure them, that's the arc, right? Also the organization, the way it's designed, that's part of the architecture. So let's explain this. When you start, when you're hiring um, strategy, it doesn't just focus on the experience that the person brings. It doesn't mm -hmm. just focus on performance, but also focuses on potential. It doesn't just focus on the pedigree, but really looks for attitudes. Are you saying, is this person a good people leader? Will this Does a person have it in him or her to lead others? That's the kind of person we're looking for, right? Attitude plus skills, not just skills. When we promote our leaders, are we just looking at the numbers? Or are we also looking at perhaps their engagement scores, how much they not just engage their people, but how many leaders they built, right? Mm. That becomes... Yeah. Right. So all of that becomes part of your architecture. And so you have to consciously build in those sort of uh, constructs within your architecture. Routines is sort of the day to day, everyday processes that sort of, you know, tell us whether an organization is hierarchical, is it bureaucratic or is it informal? How, how people communicate with each other? Do they only send emails to each other or, or are they comfortable just walking up to somebody's desk? You know, in those mm. good old days, we went to office every day. Oh, yeah. Same. Can you just pick up the phone and call somebody? Can you send a WhatsApp message? Or will you? does everything have to go through some formal channels? That's the routines. Now you have to, again, consciously build routines that emphasize this coaching culture, where, you, where seeking feedback and receiving feedback is part of the norm. And the third bit, of course, is the culture. Everything we do and we say. And culture is all about role modeling. Are your, are your, is your leadership team good coaching? Are they good coaches? Do they embody the role modeling culture? And do we celebrate these people? Are we constantly talking about, are we constantly saying good things about those that are building others? So that is part of your organization's DNA or your culture. And so give the training, encourage leaders as coaches, but also ensure that you add all of these three, the ARC to the mix, to have a, a coaching culture that constantly you know, promotes this mindset. And you, you have lots of examples from corporate world. And uh, to name a few, Microsoft, you, you speak about uh, Satya Nadella, when he took over, how he shifted the entire organization, such a giant of an organization uh, going through a, a big turnaround in culture. And you speak about how growth mindset and how it is adopted in me even in a meeting, uh, even in uh, approaching failures. 
uh, where uh, like a startup would always uh, want to fail fast and learn and move forward. Yeah. Uh, this big organization has learned to uh, approach and adapt or adopt into this mindset. And there are a few organizations where you talk about how they fail to do that because of which they got into uh, trouble. So can you yep. say more about uh, when your client is approaching you to make this ARC model work, where do you suggest they start and what is the starting point if it is already not their part of their agenda or strategy? You know, um, I'm, a, I'm biased to Satya Nadella for many reasons. He's also a senior from the University of Chicago. So uh, it was an easy, easy example, but let's not take away from the fact that, as, as you rightly said, he's done a fantastic job of truly taking a broken organization, uh, one that had huge egos at play, people called the culture very toxic, and now it's one of the most desired places to work. And yes, he says in his own words, he's done a lot of things right with, when it comes to the business strategy, uh, the AI, the cloud computing. But at the core of everything, he says, was about uh, moving to a desired organization culture. Mm. So your answer, right? How do you get started? And I think this is the key, regardless of the stage that the organization is, you listen to people. And I think that's what he did. He was a fantastic role model. He spent the first year and a half uh, along with his head of HR, Kathleen Hogan. Uh, Kathleen, again, is another very impressive woman who has endorsed the book. The two of them spent uh, about a year and a half to two years just going to different groups of people and listening to them. And they listened and they assimilated. Mm -hmm. And I think I read a case study where uh, a senior Microsoft leader had said, it didn't matter whether you were in the executive team or whether you were someone who was literally, you know, a customer facing uh, individual who had just started out uh, in his or her career. So it didn't matter how senior you were or how junior you were. He gave you the same attention, right? He was actively listening to you. Mm -hmm. And and so I guess the point is, it's not just about listening. You listen to a stimulate. You listen to go back and say, how can we now, in the light of all that we've heard, come up with a more robust model that ensures that we will fix a fairly broken culture. Mm -hmm. He recalibrated it. That's the word he's used. Hit refresh in his book. And they came up with a model. Uh, they call it a performance excellence framework. It's uh, called the coach model care framework. It's interesting because now as part of the framework, every single manager uh, in the organization, doesn't matter whether you're based out of India or Singapore or the US you know, or Brazil, every manager has to coach his or her team members. They have, of course, all the training that I was talking about earlier, but that becomes part of your key goal. You have to coach, you have to care, which means you need to have empathy for your people. You need to demonstrate demonstrate that uh, in different ways, the demonstration of that empathy. And the third piece is um, coach, care, and model. You have to be the role model, right? The one that wow. I talked about earlier. You have to be the perfect role model that carries on this mantle of taking people along in the journey. And I think Satya does that uh, with so much flair and panache. And he's very vulnerable in many places, talking about his self, his own struggles. Yes. Uh, he doesn't hide things uh, from team uh, that in fact makes him more respected and more uh, you know attractive to their uh, to his followers right yeah and and as you rightly said being vulnerable or saying that you don't have all the answers or opening up about your own past um, that is a hallmark of a good leader coach you can't expect people to open up in front of you if you mm. don't open up in front of them right uh, the very foundation of a relationship like this this leader coaching that we're talking about is trust right and in order to build those reservoirs of trust or in order to uh, ensure that you strengthen your trust equation, as, as Satya says in his own words, you have to be open with your people. And so back to coaching, right? Coaching is all about asking, not telling. And often you don't know the answers. But society and business schools and colleges and school has always rewarded us for having all the answers. So as a result, when we start, when we start our adult work life, we assume that every good manager needs to have all the answers, that we need to solve our people's problems for them. They come to us and we give them the answers. And then it sort of becomes you know, integral to who we are as leaders. It, be it morphs itself into a command and control style because we tell people what to do. Hey, this is what made Bhaskar successful. This is my playbook. And oh, Ruchira, this is how you have to do it. So mm. that's a challenge with us. And that's why often you know, in study after study, you will ask managers or leaders, 
are you a good coach? And almost unanimously, people will say, of course, I'm a good coach. But this, <laughs> the reality is very different because when they think they're coaching, they're telling people what to do. Over like 60% giving... of them are found uh, not to be coaching while uh, they are having coaching conversations. <laughs> yeah. uh, I found that research really startling. And uh, adding to what I heard you say, Ruchira, is even if a leader decides to stay in a coach-like uh, mindset, the team members or followers uh, put pressure on them saying, boss, tell me the answer. Why are you playing hide and seek? Right? You, you refer to that in a, as a culture, yeah. right? It's like a, uh, uh, it takes two to tango. It's not just the leader. Uh, there should yeah, be some absolutely. support from the system as well. To absolutely. say, hey, you know what, when you're getting into coaching conversation, you don't expect answers. Absolutely, absolutely. And there are two aspects of it. One is, as you rightly said, it takes two to, it's a two way street, right? It's a, so um, your, your leader is not the one who's giving you all the answers. You need to go to that individual and say, this is how I think it can be done, right? That's one. But the other thing is a leader also needs to be cognizant that your idea of how you coach has to vary a little bit depending on the culture that you join. Let's say you're somebody who's um, come from a, a startup where everything is sort of very informal and you can walk across you know, corridors and uh, these kind of conversations take place. And you take that same thing, let's say to go to, let's give an extreme example, just for the sake of uh, proving the analogy. Let's say you go to a, a very conventional financial services or a very different manufacturing organization. The same style of coaching is not going to work because there people are not used to being asked questions. They're used to be being told what to do. Yeah, so you have to understand that in order to get people to become a better version of themselves, which is what coaching is, you also have to embrace the cultural nuances of the organization mm -hmm. and make your way gingerly through that. In the end, you will find that right path. You will find that perfect balance of asking people and telling, but you have to be aware. Uh, just because Ruchira is saying, go ask questions, you don't just start asking questions. You find that right balance is, I think, what the book tries to tell you as well. You, you also teach in various B schools. Uh, one of the early uh, indoctrination a B school student goes through is go to your boss with answers, not problems, right? And it is understood in a different way, saying uh, uh, you should have uh, thought about a solution uh, and then go to your boss. Otherwise, don't go there. But a coach, uh, a leader as a coach, can help you uncover an answer which you have not thought before. Right? Exactly. So that unlearning takes a lot of time, I believe. And we, we should catch them uh, young where, why, when they are getting ready to get into the corporate world. Maybe a curriculum shift in a B school to include coaching as uh, part of the curriculum might do the trick. And there's one question from, yeah. You now go ahead. Ask? No, no, I'm just uh, nodding. <laughs> go ahead, please. I'm, I'll wait for the question. question from uh, our uh, YouTube uh, audience. Uh, Mr. Sri Narsimha Kate, Sri, he's, he's asking what are the traits or characteristics or charisma of an uncommon leader? Let's call the uncommon leader that fa fabulous leader coach, right? There are many, but let's talk about the top two or three. I think uh, one thing I've found with a lot of these uncommon leaders is that they are very self-aware. Mm -hmm. I think they start their journeys, their leadership journey by also first focusing on themselves before they start to build those relationships with others. And so ask, so a lot of question, questions around self-awareness. Self-awareness really realizing that nobody's perfect, right? But to be aware of those things that are your strengths, but also areas that you could do better at. And how do you do that? You do that through a lot of self-reflection, but you do that also through seeking feedback. So back to building a culture where you seek feedback, whether it's your bosses, whether it's your peers, whether it's the people that report to you. Asking for feedback actually helps you become a better version of yourself because you start to see those patterns. The second thing these uncommon leaders do is, while they know themselves, they also make a concerted effort to know their people very well. They genuinely forge those bonds. So take a Sheryl Sandberg, and because we talked about her earlier, because she's endorsed the book. Now she's a, when she joined Facebook, which as you can imagine, as a very, very senior leader, uh, as a COO, she walked to the desk of every single employee at Facebook and said, hey, I'm Cheryl, I've, I've just come on board. She made the effort to, f to remember people's names, 
spent maybe literally less than a minute chatting with them. But that sort of builds the bonds. And I've seen that time and again, and again with leaders that truly stand out as uncommon. They take the time to remember your names. They take the time to greet you in corridors. They take the time to build those bonds with you. And your own team specifically, you need to know, do a lot more than just remembering their name, right? The third thing I think is, I think, Bhaskar, you referred to that earlier, is these leaders go out of their way to create safe spaces for their people. Safe spaces mean that people can be themselves without fear of being judgment, but without mm -hmm. fear of being penalized by anything. And it's, it is these safe spaces that help them think of new ideas, be more innovative, uh, you know, unleash those reservoirs or untapped creativity, because you know that you can do things differently and that you will not be hauled up for not following what your boss says, right? So all of that and really that trust equation, they keep strengthening it and the growth mindset, which is believing that everybody can change and truly making an attempt uh, to, to get people to move to a better place that they are today. Right, making them better than they are today. True, true. Uh, really appreciate uh, you sharing this uh, insight because uh, each of these are uh, a topic by itself which can explode further to say how uncommon leader shows up at work. And uh, I want to talk about uh, a good insight which I received while working on how to grow mm -hmm. women leaders. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, one conversation I had with my daughter is about sponsorship how to uh, find a sponsor at work. And uh, she kept arguing at my little younger one, she's just nine and a half. She also joined this uh, debate and said, wouldn't it be seen as favoritism? What is the thin line between uh, having a, uh, being a favorite of your, uh, you know, boss or super boss or being, uh, having a sponsor in your super boss who talks on your behalf when you are not present uh, and proposes your name for a plum project. In their context, they were talking about uh, school context. They said, if I want to be on the committee and my teacher proposes my name, I feel really scared because my friends think that I'm teacher's pet or favorite. That's why my name is proposed. Uh, I don't want that kind of promotion. Then I uh, had to explain to her being a favorite and having a sponsor are two entirely different things. Uh, uh, but I, I am unable to tell more for a, a you know, young leader like her. I'm sure in your experience, you have found the distinction. Uh, could you please help us with your experience and anecdotes? So, you know, in the leaderships world, we had these two, um, what do I say, uh, terminologies that we use interchangeably. Uh, we call people mentors and coaches. And we've often used them interchangeably because that's how it was. We never really went down into the distinction. And having said that, they're both both very valuable and mm -hmm. should be cultivated and maintained. And, but there is a distinct difference. And then let's move on to the sponsor bit that you're talking about, right? A mentor is somebody who's typically older, doesn't have to be, but older in terms of has a lot of wisdom and has been there, done it, a lot more experience. And because of that experience and that wisdom, they tell you what to do. They give you advice, right? They're constantly, you know, uh, helping you dispense that wisdom. So they do a lot of telling. Often it's prescriptive in nature. Yes, Pascal, given your circumstances, you might want to consider doing this. So it's more about, you know, their, so it's their playbook. This is what made me successful in the past. This is how I think you can do it. That's typically how those conversations go, right? And these mentors, the key is, they're not necessarily your bosses or your boss's bosses or your colleagues. They can be an ex-client. They can be an ex-boss. They can be a family friend. Somebody who, whose opinion you value a lot, who, tr who you trust has, you know, your best interest at their heart. And, you know, the analogy I use as a mentor is somebody who's watching you from the balcony, mm -hmm. uh, who's not with you on the dance floor. The coach is with you on the dance floor, right? But they see you from the balcony and they know you and they give you that advice. Now come to the coach. A coach is what we've been talking about all along. A coach is here and now in your current ecosystem, understands the nuances of your job, understands day-to-day uh, -day what you're doing, gives you real-time feedback. Some of these uh, leader coaches will roll up their sleeves and go into the trenches with you, into the weeds, as we say. Right? So it's all the action on the dance floor. And these relationships don't have to be forever, right? They can be for short bursts while you both are connected to each other through that current uh, work ecosystem. So mm -hmm. coaches guide your current practice, mentors guide your, uh, your career journey, let's say. Now, Transpose this to a third element, which is the sponsorship that you said. 
Now, either of these two people could also be your sponsors. But who is a sponsor first? A sponsor, as you said very nicely, is the one individual who speaks positively of you, recommends you when you're not in the room. A sponsor is someone who is very senior and very influential and mm. someone who has the ability to open doors for you. A sponsor is someone who can shape your career a bit. But remember, they can go out on a limb and recommend you if they believe in you. Right. Mm. Now, a lot of the advice we give to women is, see, coaching is sporadic for both men and women because we don't quite understand the concept of coaching as leaders. We often keep telling them. And as women, we get a lot of advice. Everybody wants to tell us what to do. What we don't have is enough sponsors in the system, which means people tell us what to do, but they don't go the extra mile and open that door for you. And that's what I keep encouraging women to do. I said, if you have a mentor who truly believes in you, who's giving you such good advice, who says, hey, you're fantastic at marketing, then perhaps request him to say the next time you as I'm making this up as a chairman of the marketing confederation, when you go for your Say, I know this fantastic young woman. She would be an ideal candidate for you know this role. Please interview her. They don't have to give you the job or that role, but they can open those doors for you. And we are so hesitant to... Put your name in. Yeah, put your name in, right? Yeah, and so there is no substitute for doing great work. But when you have done that great work, do ensure that, you know, one, people see that good work and you ask for it. Do you think you could make that phone call on my behalf? Do you think you could get me that? It's okay to ask for those things. We don't have to undermine ourselves all the time. Thank you so, so much yes. for voicing these uh, affirmations, I should say. In your book, you also talk about a research where when compared to men, women, even though they're overqualified and uh, you know, you know, fitting the bill, they are shying away from putting their name in the consideration set. Whereas uh, in the research, it's found that men do not have any hesitation. Uh, even they feel that they are not qualified for the job. They just they, you know, raise their hand and put their name in. So this is something we need to often repeat in, in our uh, conversations. To say it's okay to put your name. It's okay to speak to a sponsor. Only if you have the uh, you know competence to deliver, they would believe in you and they would put your name. Otherwise, they are not going to stick their neck out and, you know, uh, risk their reputation uh, exactly. by recommending you if you don't have the uh, you know things to deliver right so uh, that's on the uh, sponsorship bit uh, and i hope uh, this is taken seriously by all the women who are listening to this and second research piece on women leadership which i came across which is uh, why women leaders have men sponsors and not many women sponsors obviously the numbers are huge uh, that is one reason the second reason which I came across is women see other women as competition. I don't have uh, you know much broader research on this across the globe, but this one particular research says if I have a seat at the table, when yeah. I recommend somebody's name, they are going to take my seat. That seemed to be the reason for seeing other yeah. women as competition. It's an interesting point, actually. Um, I don't have research data. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that keeps telling us that. So let's go back a little bit and talk about why most uh, managers or leaders don't make great coaches, right? We talked mm -hmm. about the fact that we think we're coaching, but we're telling people. Or through school and college, we've been taught how to give answers. But there's another big reason, which is self-assurance, right? And that is not just a woman thing. It's also a man-woman. What's happened is organizations have become so much flatter. Right. Uh, there aren't that many levels now that you report to somebody, somebody reports and age is no longer a barrier for promotion. Right. So there is clearly a huge sort of uh, a good leader coach needs to be very self-assured. Right. That's also a big trait. If you constantly feel that this person will steal my thunder or this person will shine brighter than me, then I'm not going to coach that person. Right. So that phenomena exists universally. What complicates matters more, I think, in the I think uh, in the women uh, paradigm is that there's so few of us, right? Mm -hmm. There are only so few of us who are shining so bright. I think we constantly, rather than supporting and lifting those to become more like us, we feel that this is our place and the sun. I've earned it. I don't want somebody else to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So these are, these are challenges. It's also how society sort of rewards us or you know, uh, emphasizes um, that the only way growth can come is by leading other people. So there's a lot to be done in that space. But we consciously need to 
I think make efforts to send that message across that uh, if you are a woman who is influential, who can be a sponsor, lift others, take them along in the journey. It doesn't take away from your shine or brilliance. I say that to men as well. And I understand that organizations need to do more to find room for those at the top or sideways as they promote other people, right? There needs to be a genuine place for you to go because then you'll be plagued by this uh, challenge that, listen, I'm going to elevate this person. Where am I going to go, right? Uh, so yeah. we have to do more, but we need to, that's why we need to consciously inculcate that into an entire organization mindset, not just an individual. And that's true even as if you're an entrepreneur running your own little business, you could have your own venture. You need to permeate this enablement mindset, making people better than they are today, giving them the self-assurance that everybody has a place to shine and radiate if they do the right thing. True. That's why you are calling this as uncommon leader because uh, they have to go grow past their insecurity and start rooting for others' growth so that they can elevate themselves in the process. There's one challenging view, uh, Ruchira, from uh, one of our LinkedIn participants, Shiva. He's asking, um, yeah, but why we have to call this, call this as uncommon? Because this should be in common leadership. Yeah, it's a good point, which is also why the book is called The Secret Code, right? Everybody, I don't know where to move it. Yeah. Yes. Why is it the secret code? Uh, everybody said, oh, everybody knows that coaching, you know, is great. Why is it a secret? I said, it's a secret. It's in plain sight, but we don't do it. Right. And that's mm -hmm. what makes it uncommon. If you look at all the statistics and the research, we know that coaching is the single most important factor for employee engagement. Right. We know cliches like uh, employees don't leave organizations. They leave bosses. We know all that yet we don't coach, yet we don't enable people, yet we don't lift them. So I guess it's back to your question. It should be common, but it's uncommon it's because there's a few of us doing it, right? In fact, the first title of the book, actually, since uh, you asked that question was coaching, the, the, the common code to uncommon leadership, right? Oh, okay. And my publishers are like, nobody will understand it. It's not common. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. And throughout your book, you talk about various myth uh, busters when it comes to a uh, leader as a coach. Oh, I don't have time. I'm always in crisis. Uh, it's better for me to give away the answer so that the team has enough time to work on it rather than me, uh, you know, spending time on coaching. Uh, it doesn't work all the time. What if the person is not skilled enough? I have to definitely train that person. All these myth busters are throughout this book and especially in a middle section, you also talk about how leaders can adopt a coach-like mindset and pick up the skills. And you have thrown lots of examples where uh, coaching has worked and leaders have shined brighter by adopting coaching uh, mindset. Could you share more about uh, what are the typical roadblocks or mindset blocks in becoming uh, or adopting coach-like persona for a leader? I think um, it's a good question. It's a whole chapter devoted to it. And I think in many ways, we've answered a few of those, right? This whole thing that we feel we are coaching and we are telling, this the lack of self-assurance. Uh, and often more leaders will say, listen, I have to do real work. You know, mm -hmm. Coaching is also seen as soft and fuzzy and very amorphous. Mm -hmm not very tangible. And I'm not lying. When I first embraced the world of coaching, I didn't know any better. Uh, when I got approached by the University of Chicago uh, to be the resident executive coach, I was at a financial services uh, firm and I was doing part of strategy for them. So I was a very hard nosed, uh, you know, advisor. And I also said, listen, I'm not sure I can do this sort of stuff. This is not my forte. Um, just so happened that circumstances and I said, okay, let's try it as an experiment because it was a turbulent time in my career and everybody had said, you're very good with leaders and you give them a lot of clarity. So, and I said, let's try this, right? And in essence, coaching, what is coaching doing for you? Uh, back to the book cover, let's place it properly. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. What is it doing for you? It's unraveling this spaghetti knot, right? And when you do that, uh, can I do it properly? Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's taking you higher, right? It untangles, but it also takes you higher and it makes you shine brighter. So in a sense, it gives you clarity. It takes away all those big knots in your head so that uh, you in turn can form distinct patterns, right? So that's what coaching is doing for you, right? Now, in the process of untangling and unraveling takes time, as you know. 
and most people don't have the mind space to do that and remember at the very core we are uncomfortable because we don't have answers because this whole mm. business is like where is the beginning where is the end uh, you know how can i help somebody if i don't know the answer myself so for a variety of reasons coaching just doesn't get done and i think there's another challenge here we think of coaching as that once a year performance evaluation that's not coaching. that's not coaching that's the end right that's where you serve a sentence to somebody coaching is a series of self enabling non directed conversations done through the year and coaching does not have to be a 45 minute formal meeting in the conference room coaching happens in many ways it happens when you bump into people in the corridor and you just spend those 3 or 4 minutes touching base and giving in the moment feedback coaching happens when you are taking a ride together and get stuck in the traffic jam wherever it is i don't know chennai i suppose even bombay for that matter bangalore. coaching happens <laughs> bangalore <laughs> okay i'll be nice go oh, bangalore actually 3 hours to the airport last time coaching also happens you know when uh, of course all of these days will come back when we take flights and we sit next to our you know team members and it's a good moment where you just where you talk about mm. you know you build those bonds you give some real time feedback but also receive feedback all of that is coaching coaching also happens when you say i have a new team member let me take him or her along when my boss's boss is visiting so that i can position this person and and remember what it means for this newcomer right mm. because you get access but that also means you have to do your homework you can't just show up in front of the global boss right but that's also coaching when you give somebody exposure when you give them a project which they normally would not have gotten that's also coaching so we have to get over this whole mindset that a coaching happens at the end of the year or a coaching is a formal one way street coaching happens in all these different ways but i think because it's it's a mindset and we haven't really talked about it much um, mm. a lot of leaders just feel that this is too much of a burden for them and this is something they have to do in addition to their day job and that's what we need to change because mm. if you read through the book there are quotes where it says coaching is what good leaders do in fact you can't be a good leader without being a coach absolutely very well said and in your book there is a a uh, caricature or a uh, artwork which talks about calendar based coaching situation based coaching yeah that comes to my mind and other thing when you talk about uh, creating that safe space for people to be themselves is what coaching is all about and uh, there's one other distinction that you brought in uh, in the book about how to convince the top leaders that coaching style works and one of my uh, experience working for a family owned business is uh, i got a chance to work with the top leadership team sat through the board meetings and then provided feedback to the top leader and the you know l minus 1 uh, team uh, one of the conversation came up saying hey we spend too much time in weekly meetings so then the leader uh, uh, said uh, uh, okay let me look at my calendar and calculate how many hours i am spending on team meetings in a week it turned out to be 14 hours can you believe yeah. it and then that revelation brought it uh, to a point where he was so motivated to reduce it down to 6 hours 50% of the time and from the next month onwards i could see a ripple effect throughout the organization and this is something uh, i capture it as a benefit or roi as they call it. uh to say okay these many people sitting together for 3 hours in a meeting throughout Uh, the week there's an annual salary package i brought it down to per hour and then multiplied it and showed it to the leader saying you have saved this much money you are paying wow. only me the pittance <laughs> but that's, that's one approach yeah uh, this, this uh, brings me to a question which uh, deepak soni uh, is asking how to establish roi for internal stakeholders intangible gains are known we have uh, you know seen that our creating a business case with tangible outcome have been a personal challenge any thoughts don't have the perfect answer but you if if i was to take the kind of example that you're giving bhaskar and okay so let's go back to what is coaching give your coachy right there's a four c's model the framework that we haven't really talked about but essentially when we coach somebody what do we give them we give them clarity we've talked about that we give them consciousness which is self awareness we give them capability very very important right capability is all about becoming better than you are today and that comes in many ways it comes uh, when 
you untap those reservoirs of hidden creativity when you let people um, open up their mind to the possibilities that exist when you help them assemble their own career ladder rather than saying i go from this role to another role etc right mm. that's what a good leader coach is doing for you and the fourth piece which i think is super super relevant not just for men but primarily for women is the confidence factor right that's the fourth cornerstone mm. and all of these will come alive with a culture of good uh culture that encourages coaching receiving giving feedback so roi question how do you establish that one thing is not just the fact that as a leader you will give clarity consciousness confidence and capability what does it do for you as a leader right i think at the core is it should free you up to focus on your strategic gears mm -hmm. if you make somebody more capable one hopes that you will do less micromanaging one hopes that you will do less of the operational stuff and you will focus more on building the business uh, building the most you know building a strategic vision etc and escalating uh, your time elevating that focusing your time on doing the bigger on focusing on the bigger picture now if you were to if you were to somehow do a calculation back calculation in terms of how many hours have you saved by not looking at every single document or every single meeting that right now you are involved in but you have perhaps spent that time and energy making somebody more capable mm. that i think is a good starting point as well right why else should you why else should you coach back to the leader as coach thing is because frankly you know the domain and you know the industry bring in ruchira she might be a fabulous coach but it will take me some time to hit the ground running because i don't know the first thing about uh, i didn't at least when i joined uh, a medical device firm right my all my experience was telecoms and financial services so it was great but even then i wasn't the domain expert i could help you with some of the powerful questions but you as a leader coach understands the huge shifts in the ecosystem you understand that all our shifts are not lateral in nature that we are pivoting our businesses are pivoting things are changing it's becoming very complex you can very quickly understand what new skills i need in the ecosystem how do i need to what do i have today and where do i need to go and you are in a much better position to coach and when you coach you will get those results remember coaching is not a nice to do or a good to do activity at the end of the day it's about making your people more capable so they help you achieve those business results so i think that's what coaching does for you true true absolutely very well said and to answer uh, the roi enthusiast uh, just be patient things will happen the egg has to break from within put to give life rather than forcefully breaking from outside which can at the max give a omelet <laughs> i think the challenge with coaching also is that we think that every like everything else um, it will have instant results mm -hmm. and it does not right it's um, i think it was a very interesting thing i was reading once <laughs> i don't know if it's a good analogy right now but it's like falling in love you don't always remember the exact moment <laughs> when that happens but it happens through a series of sort of interactions with the individual and there's something that develops between the two of you right or when does somebody become a fabulous leader right mm -hmm. it's through a series of things that you do there is no exact moment right you acquire gravitas executive presence you acquire capability and skills and you become better at managing your people and you understand the stuff better so coaching is a lot like that it has to be done consistently mindfully it has to become part of who you are for you to see the results of somebody becoming better than they are today or becoming a better version of themselves absolutely right and there's one more question in like in the similar lines from uh, shri typically leadership roles are filled by a selected leader, leaders than elected leaders how can coaching guide the journey from being a selected leader to a elected leader yeah it's an interesting question i don't know how we elect leaders any longer in organizations but um uh, i think the point i will make uh, elected or not is that often the selected leaders are very disastrous because when we select leaders we think that our best and the brightest leaders those that are achieving our numbers will automatically become the best leaders if you look at the world of cricket or you look at the world of any other sport the best captains have not been the best individual performers right sachin tendulkar stellar captain stellar no stellar leader not stellar mm. captain right the best and the brightest that the game has ever seen however his captaincy still is the darkest days of his career because a fabulous performer was unable to take his solo or his amazing craft to that of great leadership
And many reasons happen for that. One is because we are so gifted and so talented that we can't recognize how to take people with us. That's one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. The kind that I think uh, Sachin uh, uh, is a good example of that. But then there are also the fact that sometimes we elevate these, these blue-eyed boys and girls to such a level that they think they're invincible, that they have a such a strong sense of entitlement. And let's face it, leadership is not entitlement. It's also responsibility, a responsibility to build more leaders. Now, when we give these uh, superstars such inordinate uh, resources and uh, you know the ability to do their own thing, they start believing they're God. And gods are, unfortunately, these kind of gods are not very collaborative. They, they focus on the solo craft, but they don't know how to take people along. I guess bottom line is whether it's a Sachin or whether it's the superstar, they all need to be coached so they in turn can coach the leaders of tomorrow. And that's the part we're missing, right? We have to stop selecting these leaders because of their current performance. And we have to start thinking of their future potential. And when we do that, we have to give them the coaching and the nurturing and the encouragement so that they in turn can coach the leaders of tomorrow. Absolutely. And uh, to add my bit here, Ruchira, I have seen people go over the edge in their effort to win the popularity contest to be an elected leader. Uh, so many times I remind my clients saying it's not a popularity contest. Leadership is action. You may not always get time and uh, uh, opportunity to do things which are popular and you know keep you as an elected leader. So there's a thin line, uh, obviously, uh, to answer that, Shri. Thank you so much for that question. There's one more interesting uh, comment from Uday, Uday Kumar Gopalakrishnan. He's also author who will be featured uh, uh, in the next uh, edition soon. He says, it's a great conversation. Uh, thank you, Uday, for uh, joining. I didn't catch that. Could you try again? Sorry, Siri, that's not for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, he's, uh, what a, he's got a question to you, Ruchita. What did you discover as your talent or strength? And what vulnerability showed up as an author? As you scripted this, <laughs> the themes captured in the book. Yeah. Oh, many, many. Thank you very much. I have to. I mean, if I start telling you all of those, I think we might just go beyond the hour and more. But um, I think, um, uh, firstly, you know that I put together this four C model, which, in my mind, is what uh, coaching does for somebody. What is what are coaching outcomes for those that you're coaching? And believe it or not, for somebody who teaches leadership and coaching at business schools, writes about it at uh, you know several mainstream publications. I couldn't articulate it. I didn't know what it does. I, you know, so like the question that Deepak had, yes, I read in journals, in, it helps increase ROI. It helps you unleash potential. But what does that really mean, right? If as an author, if you put yourself in the shoes of the reader, you realize that you need to give people something of value. It wasn't just going to be another book which says these are five coaching models and when you use these models, you'll be the best coach possible. It wasn't that. It wasn't just about that, right? That's it was true. really about... <laughs> it was on one hand, I wanted to assimilate all the sort of literature we had there about coaching so that at your fingertips you had that, but also to leave you with a real value add and some practical applications of it, which is what the book tries to do. And doesn't want. it, doesn't, it didn't have to be an academic journal yet you know, yeah. if it was too frivolous, it doesn't go anywhere. And I spent a lot of time, honestly, trying to figure that out. And I looked at lots of journals and I couldn't get the answer. In fact, it was funny. I, I've written it in the book as well. Uh, I was my son was watching the Kung Fu Panda and I was sort of floating around. I never watch it. I'm always supposedly very busy, he says. But I was hanging around and I saw a scene and I realized, wow, this can easily transpose into you know, huge corporate or business lessons. And again, with cricket, now I'm not a cricket buff, but I have a sibling who's totally into it. And between all of these conversations, I realized we can take so many of our real life, uh, you know, lessons from performing arts, from the world of sport and art. And when we transpose them into our business context, we can really bring these learnings to life. And mm. that, was, that was in many ways, I think, um, my learning that if I really took analogies and interesting incidents and my own life story where I've you know talked about things that went right but also a lot of things that didn't go right and when I transpose that, that as an author into the narrative it makes for a much richer story but also very relatable for people mm -hmm. so I think that's where I spend the bulk of my time <laughs> trying to uh, demystify the jargon and make it palatable for everybody 
which you did. In fact, I should comment saying I, I read it like a novel, as I was telling in my teaser as well. Uh, you are the person who is uh, taking the author, I mean, reader through a quagmire of things. Hey, you know what? Watch out uh, for the pit here. Uh, look at the roses here. Smell them. And, and you take us through a journey uh, and get us convinced by the end of the book saying this is uncommon leadership, turbulent times, and coaching is a secret code. You arrive at the uh, end uh, chapter. And, and I really love the way you have peppered lots of personal anecdotes, your interviews with uh, people who have been there, done that, champions and celebrities. That gives us conviction. Yes, we are in the right direction. And uh, this one thing I have uh, you know, from this entire thing is uh, confusion about the term coaching in different parts of the world, especially yeah. in India. Uh, I grew up uh, thinking coaching is for dull students. They go to tuitions, right? When I grew up and became a leader, I got introduced to coaching. You know, you need coaching. I said, why should I need coaching? I'm not a dull student. Uh, then I realized that it is for successful leaders to be even more successful. When I became a coach trainer, I kept uh, receiving this uh, you know, question again. Why should I become a coach? Why should I uh, you know, uh, continue my job? Can I have a living as a coach and so on? Now, recently, uh, a paper article which I read uh, MS Dhoni has been named as mentor of uh, Team India. There's a coach, there is a non-playing uh, coach who is not from a uh, sports background, but they are encouraging non-playing coaches to be attached to players. Now there is a mentor. So there's a lot of confusion around. Uh, could you share your uh, you know, definition or your construct of who is a coach? My definition stays the same. A coach will ask, a coach will help, a mentor will give and advice. And a sponsor was a third category. A sponsor invests in you, right? Now, to be very fair with you, Bhaskar, it doesn't matter in the end if we change the terminology. As long as all of us as leaders, regardless of whether we have big teams or small teams, whether we are students like your daughter, who's done such a fantastic job of reviewing the book. I'm, I'm very, very pleased that you know somebody at her age has assimilated it, right? So it doesn't matter if you're, a t uh, if you're a student starting out their journey, whether you're in business school and college, whether you're setting up your own venture, whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you have, you've embraced a corporate life or left it like I have and become a gig worker, right? I think as long as the constructs we understand that we need people who ask us those compelling questions and those compelling questions help us find our own answers. Right. And not give us the answers. If we have people like that who are constantly, you know, egging us on, who are constantly helping us become better than we are today. That's fantastic. We need those people. And yes, it's great to have the mentors who give us advice and tell us what to do. And so if Dhoni is someone who's been there and done it, has a lot of experience as simply telling a prayer, listen, uh, you could have done this. I don't know through a googly or a spin i'm not a cricketer if he's simply being prescriptive perhaps that's fine too right uh, if you look at um, some of the if if you're into cricket in a big way and i uh, i've quoted paddy upton a lot in the book uh, he was the coach yeah, of the right so paddy talks about a story when he was brought in as a coach and the one thing he did was he didn't tell people what to do he mm. said you know i was a foreigner and an alien in india and i as it is, there's mistrust of us. And I didn't understand the cultural nuances, but I realized I wasn't here to tell people what to do. These are international level players. They are fantastic. They know what they have to do. And so he talks about that story of Gotham Kambhir, who could not get a certain, I think, the straight drive right. And lots of people had given him advice and they'd given him gyan and did lots of, but he said it was not for me to tell him. I helped him discover his own answer. Right? And he spends a lot of time. I've, I mentioned it in the book as well. Yes. He figured out through a certain combination of how he hit, how when he would look at the ground and then hit the bat, he got that shot perfectly right. Mm -hmm. And he said it was something about, it was unique to him as a person, how all the muscles in his body came together when he hit that shot. And he said right. that's what he helped discover, right? Help Gautam Gambhir find the answer. So he was a quintessential coach. Now, mm -hmm. in the end, if we call a mentor a coach or a coach a mentor, it doesn't matter. As long as we all, figure out that in life we need those that don't tell us but also it's equally important to have people that ask us so we can find our own answers and become better at what we are i think that's to me the key message in this book. the interest of the client at that time yes and since you mentioned about paddy upton uh, I, I was reminded of uh, gary kirsten yes uh, the coach who brought world cup to india team in 20, uh, 2011 
he was uh, appearing for a uh, interview at uh, south african uh, board soon after he resigned from uh, india uh, team right and uh, this person who was on the board interviewing gary kirsten talks about how he responded to this question why you want this job so first of all i was thinking why would someone ask a person who wants to join you who is the best coach in the world right who just proven uh, recently with an evidence that he got a world cup for a country uh, nevertheless the person who interviewed gary talks about how he appeared in the panel and uh, the response he gave really shifted my mind he said i'm no one to tell south african team how to play cricket they are expert in their game i am here to make them uncover their best version so that yeah. when they beat a opponent they beat them with humility nice i really love that response so that's sports coach or business coach or life coach it doesn't matter as you like you said the tags are for puritans to worry and you know concern about uh, it's for the client to see the value and uh, as long as they get their own answers and be the best version for themselves i think the purpose is served thank you so much ruchira for your time really uh, we are the top of the hour uh, we had wonderful audience uh, asking so many questions and some of the comments are really heartwarming to hear from uday thank you ruchira for the honesty and authenticity in your uh, response really appreciate that thank you thank you uh, ruchira again uh, we will soon meet up uh, to celebrate <laughs> your uh, books <laughs> Uh, Those are categories, I should say. Yeah, yeah. You you can find me on LinkedIn. I have a website if anybody needs to, uh, you know, get in touch with me. Yes, this is uh, how you can reach Ruchira. She's got a website and uh, Amazon. Uh, this is a top seller right now in this category. And please do, uh, you know, make a attempt to <laughs> get a glimpse of this book. It's like a good addition to your library. That much I can say. as i was telling in my teaser there are 30 pages of notes you have included ruchira it's fantastic and each <laughs> you know resource when i go in deeper and double click and see what is that research all about it opens a new world to me so thank you so much for all your hard work yeah i've given my publishers a hard time it was meant to be a book of 50000 pages it's 90000 and they didn't cut out anything and they said it's become such a thick book i said well you take it out i don't know what to do anymore it's so. very handy you know with a hard bound book it's very handy and i really love I, carrying it it's a hard bound in india and everywhere else unfortunately it's a paperback i have the paperback version singapore just sent it to me oh i don't know yeah oh, okay yeah but regardless whichever part of the world you're in and what you can get your hands of whether it's a kindle is uh, it's on kindle and i think the audible version will come out soon as well thank you thank you so much thank you sir thank you yes, for the yes. opportunity cheers good luck so, yeah. good luck bye, -bye.